Hi there, my name is Sonoma Amtora and I'll be making a quick video for you today on how to use a slit lamp, perform an examination of the patient's visual acuity and what drops mean what and this is designed for staff at the Royal United Hospital. So just to start off, the slit lamp is actually a very difficult piece of equipment to use and it takes a long time to master it and there's some nuances there. Um, but really the best thing you can do is just have a go, practice, play with it until you get familiar. So starting from the absolute basics, personally, I would recommend that when you're considering looking through the slit lamp, if you wear glasses, just wear your own glasses and make sure that the oculars are set to zero on both sides. Some people might tell you that, oh, you can set it to your own prescription and take off your glasses. But my personal recommendation would be to just wear your glasses because I don't think it makes too much difference. And the other thing to remember is that this only accommodates for your spherical prescription, not for any astigmatism. So you might not even have a great view, even if you're dialed into your correct prescription, okay? So the other thing is turning the slit lamp on. In this hospital, it can be a bit tricky. So there's two actual separate components to it. So you need to set the timer on. So either half an hour, one hour or two hours, making sure this one's on. And then also making sure that this switch is on. And if everything's on correctly, you should get a green light. If you've got a green light and you're not seeing um, a slit in front of your hand, maybe that could mean the bulb is broken. And in fact, before we go any ahead, I'm going to show you how to change the bulb and how to check if the bulb's broken as well. So what you need to do is you need to just put your fingers here and release this cover. Okay. And then you need to be quite careful as these bulbs can be very, very hot. That one's okay. And then all you do is remove the bulb, okay? Then simply look for that notch, see the notch on the top, line them up, okay? And then clip the cover back into place. You should hopefully have a spare bulb in that cupboard at the back there. Okay. And then to put this cover back on, you just make sure it's aligned correctly, which I'm struggling to do with one hand. Um, and then it should just clip into place. So that cable should be facing backwards. There we go. And if we turn it on again, we've got a green light and we've got a nice slip beam on the hand there as well, which is great. Okay, so second thing, you need to make sure that you've got the correct interpupillary distance, okay? So that means looking through the eyepieces and adjusting them each individually and at the same time to make sure that the vision and the view that you're seeing through this lamp is with both of your eyes, not just one of your eyes, because you need to get a binocular 3D view to really appreciate what's going on there. Okay, so next stage, I mean, this is quite a lot already, but I think we're going to go through all of it. And I think by the end of it, hopefully it will have demystified some of those concepts as well. So next stage, turning on the beam. Okay, there's actually a nice label here, which someone's written saying beam width adjustment. So that's actually the most important thing. If you're not getting any uh, beam, you need to widen the beam and when you do that you get a nice beam there okay and if you reduce it then it'll become even smaller and reduce it it becomes even thinner and sometimes it just helps to have a nice narrow slit just to appreciate the cornea and the different layers of the cornea and i'm probably going to try and produce some more videos of you know what you actually see through the slit lamp and the cornea to show you what you can gain from looking with a small narrow beam or versus a wide diffuse beam. And probably when you're using the fluorescein dye and you want to look at the cornea generally, you want to look at the whole cornea and you want to say, is there any you know obvious areas of fluorescein uptake, any corneal abrasion, any corneal ulcers? And for that, you probably want a wide beam with a high brightness and a low magnification. Okay, so that brings us on to magnification. Now you'd be surprised to know that about half the people uh, half the ANU registrars when we did a survey actually knew how to change the magnification. And it's quite simple, but it's something that you wouldn't know unless anyone's told you. So it's this lever here for magnification, okay? You just go 10 times and 16 times. I would personally recommend starting with 10 times because it means you get a good view of the overall structures and then you can zoom in with the 16 times if you want to. So you can see it says, well, this is one times and 1.6 times, but because the eyepiece is actually 10 times, it actually is more like 10 times and 16 times, all right? 
Okay, before we go any further, let's just have a look at this piece of equipment here. This is the Goldman Applination Tonometer, and this is used for checking the eye pressure. I probably wouldn't expect um, emergency department team to be able to use this piece of equipment because it's quite difficult and actually a lot of optometrists don't know how to use it as well. Um, if you're worried if the patient's got glaucoma or raised pressure in the eye, to be honest with you, the best thing you can do is just gently, gently with your thumb, with the patient's eye closed, just gently feel how hard the eye feels. And it shouldn't be painful, it just might be slightly uncomfortable. And what you can do is compare the eyes together, or even feel your own eye. And if you find the eyes like rock hard, the patient's got a history of the eye feeling very painful, red, swollen, the patient's sick, they've got other problems going on, the vision's blurred, then it's probably likely that the patient might actually have angle closure glaucoma. Okay, so next things to check are the filter. Most of the time, you're gonna be using the white filter. You just wanna have a look at the cornea. But the only other filter that you'd want to use is the blue filter. And actually, a lot of people get confused by the green filter and the blue filter, and people might go on the green filter here and actually think that that is the blue filter, okay? And then they'll say, there's no fluorescein uptake, there's no corneal staining, um, but actually there might be a massive corneal ulcer. Now, to be honest with you, I wish they just removed this, you know, green filter from some of the slip lamps or made it a bit more obvious because it can cause a lot of confusion, okay? So for you, you'd probably want it on the end, the brightest one, just to start with, okay? This is the heat filter and this is a lower brightness, okay? So just to make it easy, I'd say start off if the patient can tolerate it all the way at the end. If they can't, lower it to the lower brightness one, okay? But the way to change to the blue filter is you turn, you change the beam height by changing, turning this, go all the way to the end, and then you get the blue filter. So it's almost hidden in a way, um, but there it is, okay? So you can't change the height of the blue filter, but you can change the height of the white filter, okay? And this is in millimeters up to eight millimeters. And you may be wondering, why do I need to change the beam height? To be honest, you probably don't. But if you wanna change the height of the beam, you can change the height of the beam to make it the same height as the corneal abrasion or the corneal ulcer. And then you could look up and say, okay, you know what? That's a 2.5 millimeter high corneal abrasion. And that's quite useful to know if you're following up the patient because then you can measure it again and say, okay, that corneal ulcer is a bit smaller or that corneal abrasion is healing quite well, okay? So we've covered most of the basics now. We've covered how to change the slit lamp bulb. We've We've gone through how to change the slit lamp height, beam. We've gone through the actual uh, blue filter, what the different filters are, okay? We've gone through beam height. We've gone through what is the Goldman Applination Tonometer, changing the interpupillary distance by making sure you're looking through it for your correct um, you know, distance your eyes are apart. We've gone through your um, prescriptions um, and the magnification. So, you know, other things are, you know, moving the slit lamp. You want to make gross movements by holding the whole thing and you can make fine movements by using the joystick. Turning the joystick either clockwise or anti-clockwise can change the height. When the patient sat, they could even hold the handlebars and they're really useful to make the patient feel comfortable. But one of the most important things that I haven't mentioned yet is this black line. Now where the two eyelids, eyelids meet, that's called the lateral canthus, that's where the black line should be aligned to. And I can maybe put a photo of a patient sitting there now so that you know what that looks like. And that's really important just for the patient comfort. If you're finding that you're struggling to see, you're not seeing what you're expecting to, and the view's just not great, most of the time it's the patient's fault, not yours. And what you tend to find is that patients always tend to drift away while you're examining. And what you need to tell them is to make sure that their forehead is pressed against the bar at all times because if they're not you're not going to see and you're looking through the binoculars okay so you're not going to be able to tell that so sometimes just take a step back have a look at the patient and you'll find they're just miles away so i just tend to emphasize to them just focus on making sure that your forehead is pushed against the bar okay so other controls that are useful obviously you lift the table up and down with this handle underneath the table okay there's a drawer in here which might be where you can find the lenses, okay? Um, and that's pretty much it. The other thing is if the slit lamp's not working, you might find that the cable under here is quite loose, so just make sure that's plugged in there as well, okay? Always make sure you've got a tissue box which is full of tissues, because the last thing that you want is when you put some fluorescein in the eye and it's running out of the eye, then it's just going all over the place, because that just doesn't look great. Also, this is the breath guard, and that saves the patient from blowing their breath into your face, even though, this is there, you still do have some, you know, odours sometimes, but you know, it might help protect you from the coronavirus. Okay, so just to go through some of the lenses, 
This is actually an indirect lens, a 20 diopter lens, and you wouldn't be using that with a slit lamp. This is for the headset, so don't worry about that lens at all. This lens, on the other hand, is a 90 diopter lens, and that's for using, that's used to look at the back of the eye with the slit lamp. Okay, so you could use that, but it needs quite a lot of practice, and hopefully we can do some practice training sessions, um, and you know, get people more confident with using the slit lamp. Because even after watching this video, you'll know what the buttons do, you'll know what the different functions are, you might know some tips and tricks and some nuances, but it's all about practice. Okay, so let's talk about visual acuity. Okay. Sometimes people get confused about how to talk about vision and which is it 60 over 6, is it 6 over 60? The baseline is 6 over 6, so most people, the healthy person, the normal person, should have a visual of six, visual acuity of 6 over 6 in both eyes, okay? It then goes 6 over 9, 6 over 12, 6 over 18, 6 over 24, 6 over 36, and 6 over 60. And the numbers essentially mean, um, the first number is what the patient can see, and the second number is what a normal person could see. So 6 over 60 simply means that your patient can see at 6 metres what the normal person could actually see at 60 metres. Okay? What's really important is that you ask the patient to stand on this black line. This stool is for children because it might be too, they might be too, uh, not tall enough to be able to see. So they stand on this black line and they look towards this mirror. Okay? And then you need to make sure that the patient closes one eye or covers one eye. And you can actually use this occluded because even when patients are covering one eye, sometimes, you know, if they're not too bright, they can actually be looking through the gap between their fingers as well. Okay? So they stand on here, they cover one eye, they read as low as they can go, they then cover the other eye, they read as low as they can go, and then you've got the visual acuity. And that's actually probably the most important thing to record. And it doesn't require any skill at all, but it's just really important to get your numbers in the right order and to use the correct technique. You can then even refine it a bit further by asking the patient to look through the pinhole. And this is the pinhole here. So if you get the patient first to look without the pinhole, lower this, and sometimes people can look, I see a bit clearer through the pinhole. And that's because it just acts a bit, just to reduce the aberrations in the back of the eye, but we don't need to worry about that. The other thing is it's really important to make sure the patient's wearing their glasses when they have their visual acuity checked, because really it doesn't really matter what their vision is without the glasses, the only thing that matters is their corrected visual acuity, their acuity with the glasses, okay? Let's go through some of the drops now and what you might need to use each one of them for, okay? We're, targeting, we're not targeting the set ophthalmologist, we're targeting, targeting the set, you know, what you might need to know in an emergency situation in the emergency department, okay? So we've got here um, acetazolamide, prolonged release capsules, these are to reduce the pressure in the eye. And behind that, we've got the acetazolamide 250 milligram stat release drops, I mean tablets, okay? And that will be used in acute angle closure glaucoma. So if you think that the patient's got a hard eye, painful, sick, and you're worried that they've got angle closure glaucoma, that's probably the best bet to start off with some acetazolamide tablets, okay? Now here we do have the acetazolamide 500 milligram IV injection solution, and that's for further reduction of the pressure as well. Okay, sometimes the tablets just don't cut it, and in some cases, you actually might want to give the IV treatment straight away. The Timolol drops there are also for reducing the pressure. You have to be careful if the patient's got COPD, asthma, because even though it's only a drop, it can actually be absorbed through the nasal mucosa because some of the drop drops end up going through the back of the nose. And because the nasal septum is so vascularized, you do actually get some systemic absorption there as well. Next, we've got exocin, which is actually ofloxacin, 0.3% eye drops. And we tend to keep this fluoroquinolone antibiotic eye drop just for corneal ulcers. If you're seeing someone at night time, you might want to give this to them to start with, you know, usually a one hour interval. But actually, in most cases, it's better for an ophthalmologist or eye doctor to see them first, because if they've got a significant corneal ulcer, you might want to take a sample from that. And if you give them antibiotics straight away, the sample may be negative in that they do have a positive culture otherwise, and it might be difficult then to tell what organism is causing the ulcer. If it's a really small ulcer, so one millimetre or so, we wouldn't take a corneal scrape, and you're best off just giving them the exocin and bringing them back the next day to be seen in the eye clinic. Maxidex is dexamethasone, 0.1% eye drops. Again, I wouldn't expect you to start that um, without any ophthalmic advice. Uh, the fluoromethylone is more for an anterior segment, corneal inflammation, which is a mild steroid. The levofloxacin is an alternative to the ofloxacin. Some people say it's a bit kinder. The next one we've got is the Vergan, which is the Gancyclovir 0.15% eye ointment, which should be used five times a day in patients who you worry have got herpetic um, corneal um, defect. Then we've got prednisolone 1%. 
I mean, I would say they're probably pretty similar to the dexamethasone eye drops. Some people have just got preferences. The Simpli ointment is just a, it's like a lanolin based uh, artificial cream that goes on the eye just for soothing. Um, next, we've got fusidic acid, which might be a second line if someone's allergic to chloramphenicol that you use twice a day, whereas the chloramphenicol ointment that you've got there, which is our bread and butter, most common, that's why we've got so much of it in the cupboard, is probably like a three or four times a day for a week for a corneal abrasion or conjunctivitis, any type of conjunctivitis. Here we've got our angle closure box for glaucoma. And if you've got a patient who's got angle closure glaucoma, you really want to give them everything. But I would say, you know, the most important drop is probably pilocarpine, which we do have here. And if you've got a patient who's got angle closure glaucoma, a mid dilated pupil, you'd probably want to be giving this pilocarpine maybe up to every 10 minutes. I mean, every case is different, but you know, you have to assess it on each patient. But essentially, you want to throw the kitchen sink at these patients and use all the drops for all the patients, okay? Next, we've got phenylephrine. Okay, that's a dilating drop. Again, make sure the patient's not got any arrhythmias. Oxybuprocaine is a is an anaesthetic. Fluorescein, the most important one, you know, is very important there. Um, people do have a tendency to, you know, pour the whole minim inside the eye, okay? But really, from this minim, you actually probably only want to give less than half a drop, because that's what will cover the surface of the cornea. The last thing you want is all the fluorescein pouring out of the eye, down their clothes, all over the floor, okay? Next, we've got atropine. That's a long like a long acting dilating drop, which you probably wouldn't want to use. We've got the lidocaine and fluorescein mixed combined there. And for this condition, we'd want to use that for staining the cornea and also giving it a local anesthetic. And that would be for uh, using golden application tonometry. Behind there, we've got the iopidine, which is a uh, pressure lowering drop as well. Okay, we've got an Evolve HA there. And usually we actually tend to stock up this part of the cupboard with some lubricating drops. So the Evolve HA, Carmelo's or sodium hyaluronate, those are artificial tears. There we've got some acyclovir tablets and Cellulvisc is an artificial tear, a thicker one, which feels quite nice. These are eardrops, so I'm not really sure what they're there for. Uh, tropicamide is your gold standard dilating drop. It probably lasts around two or three, four hours. Not too long, but gives you good dilation in most patients. Maybe in diabetics, they might not dilate so well. So you might want to use phenylephrine as well. Cyclopentylate is good as well for dilation. Then we've got tetracaine, which is a bit of a stronger um, you know, anaesthetic, but it stings quite a bit. And then we've got our saline. Um, so I think that's pretty much everything you might want to know. Um, I've tried to give you the best I can there in terms of how to use a slit lamp, what are the functions, what are the nuances. Um, overall, I would just say practice as much as you can. We can try and do some practice sessions as well with you. And the other thing is, you know, just practice on each other. Okay. Um, you're more than welcome to come to the eye clinic. My email address is s.mamtora. That's Mike Alpha Mike. T-O-R-A at NHS.net and if you email me or even come up to the clinic or talk to any of my colleagues we'd be more than happy for you to sit in any clinics where we've got a sit lamp which has a camera where you can see exactly what we're seeing while we're examining patients um, and yeah all the best thanks a lot for watching this video